Hello, and welcome to episode four of the SQIP series, Interviews with Distinguished Qualitative Researchers. I'm Logan Barsigian, a graduate student at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Heidi Lovett about methodological integrity, um, along with some illustrations drawn from her recent theory of LGBTQ genders. Dr. Lovett is a professor in the clinical psychology program at the University of Massachusetts, Boston in the Department of Psychology. She's a past president of the Society for Qualitative Inquiry in Psychology, or SQIP, which is a section of the American Psychological Association's Division V, Quantitative and Qualitative Methods. She chaired the development of the SQIP recommendations for reviewing and designing qualitative research. Also, she chaired the development of the inaugural set of APA journal article reporting standards for qualitative, mixed, and qualitative meta-analytic methods, as well as overseeing their recent integration into the seventh edition of the publication manual of the APA. She's been awarded fellow status by APA in Division 5, Quantitative and Qualitative Methods, Division 29, the Society for the Advancement of Psychotherapy, Division 32, the Society for Humanistic Psychology, and Division 44, the Society for the Psychology of Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity. She's been an associate editor for the journal Psychotherapy Research and is a current associate editor for, editor for Qualitative Psychology. Dr. Lovett, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Thank you for the introduction. So the first question is just, what is methodological integrity? Um, and also, why is it important both within qualitative psychology, but also within the field of psychology as a whole? Awesome. So, uh, so the idea of methodological integrity really emerged in part because of a growing interest in qualitative research. And so what was happening was that, uh, you know, in the beginning when I was conducting qualitative research and I submitted my work to journals, uh, many reviewers weren't familiar at all with those methods and they would say, you know, hopefully they would say, usually they would say, or you'd hope they would say, I'm not able to review. And then other researchers were very, very knowledgeable about those methods and they would do, you know, a very good job reviewing. But um, fortunately, what's happened is more and more and more psychologists are learning more about qualitative methods, which is awesome and excellent. And, um, but at the same time, you know, we, we're not really requiring any sort of, we don't have a requirement uh, from APA on any sort of in-depth education on qualitative methods in graduate programs. And so uh, this leads us, has led us to the position where there are many people who have learned something about qualitative methods, which is great, um, but not a lot. And, and it was challenging often for, for those people to figure out, well, how do I review methods uh, that are maybe qualitative, but not, from, but not the qualitative method that I know? Um, how do I make sense of methods that maybe are the qualitative method that I know, but they're being used with a different kind of spin, like with within a critical approach to inquiry or a constructivist or uh, a different kind of way of thinking. And so there was, the, there sort of became a trend whereby I think to make sense of, of this confusion, uh, journals and um, I think uh, researchers started trying to codify what are these different methods and sort of creating almost like a little um, guideline list for each method. Like if you're doing this method, you should do this. And I think reviewers started naturally doing that with the methods that they knew. They would think, well, I know um, grounded theory, Alas, Stress, and Corbin. I'm going to evaluate all grounded theory <laughs> work based upon what I know, which is grounded theory, Alas, Stress, and Corbin. But the papers may not, may not be that way. And they may, and also um, even, you know, the methods by those original researchers evolve over time. Um, and uh, and, and research methods should be tailored to fit the research topic that someone's investigating, the participants, um, the researchers' own perspectives and resources and questions and um, study characteristics. So there was, it became that there was these sort of rigid guidelines that people were applying and expecting people to either stick with, um, you know, rigidly the method as they knew it or the method as it was an originally proposed, which led to a lot of chaos in the review process because you could have, you know, I, I've had, an, I know many quality researchers have had the experience of having 
submitted a piece and having, you know, one reviewer think it's awesome. One reviewer say, it's not the, it's not the method that I think you think you're using because I don't understand that method that way. Another me person not understanding what's going on. Like, so there could be very, there was a very little, uh, it was a lot of very difficult to think about, you know, how do we frame and uh, develop an understanding of qualitative methods that really is based upon the idea that qualitative methods need to be adapted to the question, to the approach to inquiry, um, to the subjects and participants. And so, uh, so the idea of methodological integrity was really responding to that. It was trying to, we were trying to really develop a way of talking about uh, a rationale for how should methods be adapted? How could you assess the adaptation of methods so that they're most appropriate given your questions and participants? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, can you explain a little bit more about um, how it was developed and just more detail about uh, what it entails? Sure. So um, it was developed really at the beginning of SQIP. So, so SQIP is the Society for Qualitative Inquiry and Psychology. And at, at the first meeting at APA in SQIP, I went to Ruth Ellen Josselson, who was the president, and, and proposed this idea. And she was very interested in in it and supportive and she brought it back to the board and they talked about it and um, a decision was made to form a task force which I was thrilled about because I got to invite you know this dream what to me was like this dream <laughs> team of qualitative researchers so um, I had I invited Sue Morrow and Joe Ponerado and Fred Wirtz and Sue Matelski and they all agreed immediately which was wonderful um, and uh, I started off with the draft of a paper that I uh, that I uh, wanted to put forward to them and really invited them to think with me about, you know, how do we frame a uh, defense for the adaptation of methods mm -hmm. and um, and really wanting to think about how do we frame a defense that's going to that's going to respectfully and appropriately span the very many different approaches and philosophies mm -hmm. and goals that qualitative researchers have. So this was no small challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. And we spent like a number of years really like we I started off with like a draft but it, we spent a number of years going back and forth with terminology and different language and thinking about how do we um, you know adequately really address this problem. And uh, we invited consultants from across different qualitative approaches and uh, perspective. So um, we, we, I think we ended up with 13 or so people, but we, these include people like Joe Gaughan and Clara Hill and Linda McMullen and Cynthia Winston Proctor and Ken Gergen. And we, we wanted to get people who really would bring uh, a history of working with different kinds of problems and ways of thinking about qualitative work. And try, and we sent out, you know, our, draft as it evolved for feedback and then sent it out again for feedback and we try to incorporate their thoughts until we felt confident that, that that what we developed would be actually useful for the field and and um you know would advance qualitative methods writ large rather than you know hold some back <laughs> absolutely yeah wonderful and then um i wonder if you can share more detail about um you know what the um what the process looks like in terms of assessing methodological integrity um, either you know of course while you're conducting your own particular study and looking toward doing the write-up or potentially if you're on the outside um, you know trying to assess the quality um, of a qualitative study what are some of the key factors you'd be looking for so methodological integrity is based on the idea that the research methods that are being used need to be appropriate and should be maximally useful mm -hmm. in helping to understand the particular study question that you have, the particular mm -hmm. research um, participants that you're interested in understanding or mm -hmm. data source, um, that, there, that, that, that the things, the, the qualities that you have, the questions you have as an investigator, um, the philosophical perspective, perspectives that you're bringing are all important in thinking about how your method should be best tailored to get the responses that you want that will serve your goal. And so, um, and so there's two central ways of 
thinking about this and uh, components of methodological integrity. And so the first is this idea of fidelity, mm -hmm. which is the idea that as researchers, we're really wanting to develop an understanding of the phenomenon we're studying that that's going to be faithful to the experience in the world. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this, you know, holds true whether you conceptualize your phenomenon in, in, a, in a realist kind of perspective mm -hmm. um, or whether you think of it as a, in a social constructionist perspective or whatnot, because even if I see what I'm studying as being something that's constructed, I want to faithfully represent the way it's constructed mm -hmm. in the world. I see. Mm -hmm. And I want to represent the way that um, people make sense of that, the way that that concept is used, uh, how it functions. And so, so the idea of fidelity remains relevant across perspective in this way. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the second idea is the idea of utility. And so here the focus really is on the ability of your study to serve the goals that you have for it. And so here again, if depending on your goals, the kinds of methods you, you use, the way you use them, the, the people you recruit w could be quite different, mm -hmm. um, reasonably, right? And, and desirably. So uh, if you're doing, you know, and qualitative researchers I think are so diverse in terms of what those goals may be. So you, you could have researchers who are trying to develop a hypothesis for, a, for an experiment that they want to do. Um, you could have researchers who are doing a study to guide clinical practice, in which case uh, the kind of data that they want is, is needing to have a, a lot of richness in terms of that will guide clinical decision making, very different than the kind of data you might need for developing, developing a hypothesis, which you're wanting to hold true across you know, um, a lot of diversity within a population. Uh, or you could have a study that's looking at, um, that's using a critical perspective and, and wanting to shed light on issues around oppression and um, maybe make social change in some ways. And so then again, the kinds of outcomes you're looking for and what's desirable is really different. And so the focus of ethological integrity is the idea that your methods should be evaluated based upon how well they serve. The, that purpose, how well they help you really capture a true understanding, mm -hmm. how well they advance your goals. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So it's a, it's a lot more about um, something like um, internal consistency for a particular, a particular research study based on the stated goals, the stated epistemologies of the particular researcher um, and the methods that they're using instead of, um, you know, kind of having a standardized approach across all different studies that's really the the core of methodological integrity it absolutely is because because the idea is that if you're just if you're going to um expect everyone to do the same thing mm -hmm. because our goals are so different right. it will not serve everybody <laughs> absolutely yeah. absolutely um, are you able to go and just give us a little bit of in, um, information or illustration of um, each of those four areas um, for um, both fidelity and utility? Yes, I, I'd be glad to do that. Um, so just briefly again, right, the idea of fidelity is how do you get a really clear um, and faithful understanding of the phenomenon that you're studying? And so there are four elements within fidelity that are focused on on data collection and also data analysis. And the first one being uh, obtaining adequate data. And so the focus there is really that you should be thinking about your question and what would be adequate kinds of data for your question. As, as qualitative researchers, um, you know, adequate data doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, obtain like one person who, who has every identity category and all the intersections of all the people who have every identity category. I mean, it, right? It, 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 and it, it means really thinking about what are the ways that um, diversity unfolds within my question? What are the different experiences that people have of my question? And trying to find data sources or participants who can shed light on those kinds of experiences so that you can really meaningfully give create a sense of the whole experience of your, 
phenomenon, um, especially as, and specifically really as it relates to your question. Mm -hmm. uh, and the number of people who, you know, often comes up as an issue that's raised a lot in this question of adequate data and, um, and different qualitative methods will deal with that differently, but but really the question is sort of like, do you have enough data to develop a, a, a rich understanding that is going to shed light and be informative about your experience? And so things that, that people will do to enhance adequate data would be things like develop getting saturation. Mm -hmm. um, so we tend to see that when people do qualitative studies, the first people who they're interviewing, everything they're saying is new. <laughs> right, right. And then as you keep interviewing, there's less and less new information. And, and at some point, um, the, the benefits of continuing to interview um, disappear because you're just having people repeat the same sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So because of that, it becomes a, you know, people often will track saturation. I, in, our, in our meta analysis on um, psychotherapy research, we found um, with, with on clients' experiences, we found a, an average number of clients being around 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not, a, you don't necessarily need a huge number of people to obtain a really thorough and rich understanding of a phenomenon. And, and it'll depend on your phenomenon, the diversity mm -hmm. of experiences within your phenomenon and, uh, and the scope of your question, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it, it really can vary quite a bit, but, instead of having sort of a magic number, you know, really thinking about what is adequate given my question, given the kind of data that I'm getting, given the applications I have for my data. Uh, next, our perspective management. So perspective management in data collection um, is, is the second one we talk about. And, and so here you're thinking about what are my own perspectives and how does that influence the way that I'm collecting my data, the way I'm asking questions, um, you know, how, what might I be not asking? Um, that could be important. And people will do many things like have different sorts of participant checks sometimes on the data collection process, or we often like to ask participants, is there anything that I didn't ask? Mm -hmm. um, and so ha having questions like that, that help you feel confident that you have a thorough understanding and that your data is rich in the collection process. Mm -hmm. And um, if I could ask a follow up on that, yeah. um, you use the term perspective management. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think in qualitative research, it often comes up how much, um, you know, you might be, um, you know, that it's, it's good to use your perspective and to be aware of it rather than attempting to um, eliminate it the way that you might in, you know, some more quantitative types of research. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about um, you know, that process in different ways that might look um, kind of depending on your approach with qualitative research. Yeah, so there, there are different ways people will, like I use the word management, there's different ways people will manage their, their perspectives. And, and sometimes man, by management, I don't, I'm glad you're asking this question because I don't mean pretend it doesn't exist, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. But more be aware of it, right? And be able to talk about it, be able to write about it in your, in your write-up. Mm -hmm. um, think about how that would how that would could influence your participant, and um, and sometimes um, that may mean being more open and trying to put trying to put your perspectives to the sides, like phenomenologists do in bracketing, mm -hmm. or it could mean things like being really aware of your perspectives and talking to participants about them overtly, right? Mm -hmm. So you can do very different things with them, but you would need to be aware of what you're doing, mm -hmm. making decisions that are uh, deliberate based upon what you think will further your study and, and mm -hmm. your fidelity and your utility, and then, um, and then writing about those. So it's overt and it's not hidden mm -hmm. in, your, in your paper, right? So th those are all parts of management, right? Mm -hmm. Right, um, so it could really look very different, it sounds like. It could look very different, yeah, right. it could look very different. Um, and then in data analysis, it also could look very different. Often in, in data analysis, um, you know, uh, you could do all of those things, but you also could say, well, I'm going to use my perspectives as a lens for my analysis. So I'm going to take my critical perspective and I'm going to say, well, I'm coming to this approach to this data with a critical race theory perspective or with a psychoanalytic perspective. And I'm going to use this theory 
as a lens to make sense of the data and to help increase my perspicacity in terms of identifying findings, right? So, um, and again, that could be fine to do, but you're going to want to be aware that that's what you're doing and communicate that in some clear way in your paper so the reader can understand, right, that this was a methodological choice that you've made to support your question and your goals. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then the last one for fidelity is groundedness. So qualitative mm -hmm. researchers, uh, I think one of the most uh, typical features is, is that we tend to use quotes um, mm -hmm. from either our data source or our participants to bring to life the experience of our uh, participants or bring to life the experience that's being talked about, um, show the, the rhetorical practices or, you know, depending on the methods that we're using. And so, um, so that becomes a really important thing to do. And I think that drawing forward how that, how central that is in fidelity to, in terms of Create, allowing people to assess the value, the um, the integrity of your analysis mm -hmm. is important. Um, also, because it, it is a reason why qualitative research needs more space. <laughs> in terms mm -hmm. of that, right, <laughs> right. Because especially, I think groundedness. Um, you, you need a lot of space to be able to present a results section in a way that really shows how did your findings evolve from the data. Mm -hmm. uh, and so being able to find quotes that are evocative and illustrative and, um, you know, and add to the reader's understanding is, is what qualitative research is known for. Absolutely. So in terms of um, utility, there are also four elements. Mm -hmm. And the first one being contextualization. So mm -hmm. as a qualitative researcher, our finding, we, we tend to think of our findings as being very um, contextually shaped and informed and we present our results by describing the context in which they were, uh, data was gathered, the situations of our participants, the identities that they held, that we hold, um, and really thinking about what, what are the environmental and um, and, and some political and contextual kinds of qualities that shape the kind of understanding that's being evolved, mm -hmm. so or being put forward in the paper. So, um, so that becomes really important, both in terms of framing who our participants are, framing um, when we're doing our questions, and also even in framing our quoted data. You know, where did this quote come from, and how is that different than that quote? Right. Mm -hmm. So all the way through thinking about um, context. Uh, as qualitative researchers, a, a, a second one for utility is the catalyst for insight. We really want our data to be able to produce insight, which means that we need to be good at interviewing and we need to learn how to ask questions and mm -hmm. how to invite people to talk about experiences that sometimes are very difficult to talk about mm -hmm. and sometimes are. Um, are complex and sometimes bring our participants to formulate things that they haven't formulated before. Uh, and so those sorts of skills are, are really central in, in get, gathering data that would be able to produce new insight. Because um, if you don't have insightful data, you're not going to have an insightful analysis at the end, right? right? So the third one then being meaning contribution, which is sort of the analytic um parallel so uh that it's not so helpful if you do a qualitative study and you find something that everyone else has already found <laughs> before, <laughs> right? it, it won't um it won't it won't have utility right it won't be useful mm -hmm. in terms of putting forward a new uh, something that would be useful and in, in um, moving along your field. And mm -hmm. um, it could be that you're deciding that you want to do some sort of replication study, but even then, that would be the contribution. You'd have mm -hmm. to frame it so people would understand, like, this is the contribution. Mm -hmm. um, but typically, because, again, qualitative research, the expectation is that context will matter so much, mm -hmm. there isn't an emphasis on replication studies, but rather on looking at how meanings, it tends to be that we look more at um, how meanings are shaped and change in different contexts with different kinds of participants. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, you know, that could be possible to do replications for these two um, in certain circumstances. 
uh, the last element of utility is the idea of coherence. And so here the, the idea is that as a qualitative researcher, you may have participants who say, I like the phenomenon and other ones who say, I don't like the phenomenon. Or it, you may have many types of disagreements among your participants um, or among your data sources. And so it will be important for you to think about like, how do I present this in a way that will be useful for people? Because just knowing some people like this, people don't like this, isn't so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing when they like something, how they like, how people find something helpful, mm -hmm. um, what are the blocks, uh, what are the situations where this happens that it's, you know, that it, it, it ends in one way or in another way. So this kind of um, work towards creating a really a coherent paper that people can then know how do I apply these findings. Mm -hmm. right? So that's sort of the last part of utility. You know, it's been a few years, um, you know, since the, the published version of methodological integrity has been out. And I'm wondering, um, have you encountered any common misunderstandings um, and or critiques of methodological integrity? Um, and if so, how would you correct those uh, misunderstandings or address those critiques? I've been really pleased with the reception of methodological integrity as a concept in qualitative research. Uh, you know, I was invited by APA to do a film that's that we can, I don't know if we can put a link, but maybe we can oh, to it that's freely available for people who are learning to review qualitative research. That's so mm. sort of like a step by step how to go through a paper. Mm. Oh, fabulous. And, mm. and review it. So that that's uh, APA created and is online and people can access it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, most recently, uh, the um, concept of methodological integrity has been incorporated in the new edition of the APA manual for publication. Yes. So I'm really excited about that because they um, thankfully, you know, grac graciously allowed space to talk about that kind of concept and to try to frame, you know, mm -hmm. that the idea that as qualitative researchers, we're going to need um, to think about evaluate, we're going to need to have our methods assessed in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. and to have some explanation in the manual you know about that a little bit so in the end you know in the SWIP article also I go into a lot more detail on the four elements that comprise fidelity and that comprise utility mm -hmm. and talk about talk about those some mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, so I've been really frankly thrilled <laughs> and, <laughs> because it's kind of it was you know beyond my dreams to um, have this go into the publication manual and so i'm hoping that it'll have a widespread sort of impact in our field and and um you know really encourage people to begin to think about qualitative methods and their evaluation and design um really by thinking about what is the logic of my study and my goals and my perspectives and not um how do i get a checklist on what the steps are and just follow them sort of blindly Now that we've done the overview of um, methodological integrity, um, I'm hoping you could give us some examples from your own research. Um, and so um, you recently developed a new theory of gender um, based on extensive qualitative and mixed method research with LGBTQ communities. And um, so I'm curious, first, um, how does your theory conceptualize gender and how does this depart from existing understandings of gender within both mainstream and LGBTQ psychology? Okay. Um... The theory conceptualizes gender in, in a way that is a little bit different than the ways we have traditionally talked about gender in psychology or, or in any case define gender in psychology. Um, I, I'm framing gender as being something that has a, a functional kind of purpose and I'm interested in looking at and, and really I should say gender identities as mm -hmm. having a functional kind of purpose. Mm -hmm. and. Um, rather than just sort of like a fixed identity label that um, that just sort of comes from somewhere and is applied to someone and then um, reflects something about them forever. Mm -hmm. um, that I'm interested in looking at these gender identities as something that stem from a cultural context that serve cultural purposes and um, 
And I think that that's more useful because we find that people's gender identities, they can change and um, that uh, um, gender communities evolve and even within communities, the understandings of gender change. And, uh, and so thinking about, well, why do they change? <laughs> How do they change? What are the, what are the conditions, right? Um, is something that's very central in my work and I've been really focused there. Um, and can you give us an example of what you mean by like gender communities? So we've looked at seven different communities of LGBT people and um, we've looked at butch and femme identities uh, we, within a lesbian community mm -hmm. um, and We've looked at uh, bear and leather communities within different gay male communities. We've looked at um, transgender um, identities within a more nationally scoped qualitative mm -hmm. study and um, house and ball genders we've looked at uh, by looking at in, in two different locations by looking at those communities and um, how does gender evolve there and also uh, a, a more nationally scoped study of um, men who do drag, who are, who are identified as gay men. So, um, so we've tried to really pull from communities that had a lot of diversity within them in terms mm -hmm. of the gender diversity that they had, the gender identities that they had, um, the uh, racial composition of the communities and ethnic composition, the um, the, whether they identify more as uh, binary or non-binary. And so we pulled uh, across this kind of program of research. So then after doing this research across these different communities, I became really interested in trying to identify what are the patterns across these communities? What are the ways that there are similar experiences? And I noted quite a number of similarities across the communities, mm -hmm. as well as some differences. And so um, wanting to really see if I could pull forward what, how could we develop an understanding of gender that comes from these more marginalized spaces, right? Where people's sense of their own gender isn't fitting with being a man or a woman, but it is more complex than that and, and is, um, you know, situated more on the side of mainstream understandings of gender. And, um, and this is very much in, in keeping with sort of a standpoint feminist approach to understanding um, identity where, uh, whereby by thinking about the margins, it sort of helps you to see, well, where are the boundaries of what are the mainstream kinds of perspectives and, and what are their limits and where do they not go? And so that really became a driving force for me in terms of developing a theory of gender. Wonderful. So it's really, it's, it's an understanding of gender that it's getting um, beyond the idea of, of kind of man and woman or male, female as like the ways that gender can be, right? And you're saying that it actually, the way that people kind of identify and do their gender serves specific functions within specific communities, especially at the margins. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. men and women are two ways that gender can be, but they're not the only ways gender can be. And even men and women are, are is such a, um, there are so many subtleties in the way gender is even within those categories and so many things <laughs> of gender even within those categories. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think what's really, I think what's really lovely and um, and I think maybe more unique about LGBTQ communities is that because they're on the margins, there's a heightened awareness mm -hmm. of those complexities and uh, um, a heightened awareness of you know where gender is working and how it's not working. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that this is um, a functionalist theory of gender, that there's different functions that genders perform. And I'm wondering if you can you know, tell us a little bit about what those are in your theory. Awesome. Uh, so in, in this theory of gender, there are uh, four different domains that gender is thought of as operating. And we don't really talk, it, I don't talk in the theory about uh, biological experiences of gender mm -hmm. um, per se, because 
again, my because my research is based upon qualitative analyses, and so I'm not doing you know genetic analyses or things like that. But um, but the four areas are I'll, I'll go through them maybe. Okay. So psychologically, so gender psychologically impacts people because we are craving a sense of authenticity and um, being able to feel authentic in our identities, being able to communicate to other people who we are, uh, having a language for who we are. And this is a, a really central need for people uh, who don't um, fit as neatly into the sort of binary gender categories. And so it becomes imp important to try to think about across these communities, people were thinking about how do I develop language? How do I develop a sense of self, right? How do I feel authentic in, in that sense? And, uh, and so that I can accept myself and also talk to other people so that they can understand me and then accept me. And, um, and this quest was a very complicated quest for some people. It, it took many, many years. For some people, they would try an identity and then stay with that for a while. And then another identity would come that would feel more authentic to them and they would move into that identity. Um, for some people, they would move into an identity and it would, it would fit. <laughs> right, right. right. And that would be it. <laughs> and so, um, so I think the functional piece is useful because it's, again, it's not just looking at it as though there's one label that's right for you, but that this is like a process. It's, it's a process of trying to figure out how do we talk about who we are and how do we talk about who we are is, is also in um, relationship to the needs we have that are being, uh, that are not being met in our lives uh, or the ways we're not being seen that, that feel like, hey, this is also a part of me, right? That's important. So, um, so that's sort of the psychological piece. There's a cultural piece in that um, different groups of people have had the um, uh, characteristics of gender denied to them. So, um, so for instance, uh, um, men who are gay are told, well, you can't be uh, if you're going to be, a, if you are feminine, you can't really be a man, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you are a gay man, then you have to be feminine, <laughs> <laughs> right. right? So there are these different sorts of um, stereotypes that come into place that, that are quite constricting and that are um, culturally become accepted into just our expectations mm -hmm. around gender. And then people have to sort of rail against them because they don't fit, right? So mm -hmm. for... Um, so for, for, for instance, people who were bare or leather men, they, they are, you know, would be, they would be saying in the interviews, well, we are gay men and we also aren't feminine. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have to create a space for this, uh, po this possibility that, you know, that, that has been not, uh, allowed for. Right. Mm -hmm. And so having this gender identity, bare or leather created that space. Right, it responded to a need for a, a space to contain those different sorts of identities and, and how they went together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or trans identities mm -hmm. emerging, right, from being told, well, you have to be either this or this, mm -hmm. um, and this has to fit with the gender you were assigned at birth, and and people say no, <laughs> <laughs> right, like it doesn't meet, it doesn't meet. Right, my need for authenticity doesn't represent who I am, and so right. sort of a cultural protest occurring when people who who shared different sorts of needs, who shared experiences of, of having parts of them being invisible, uh, communing and developing a sense of hey, we are okay. Here, here's a word we're going to use for it. Here's an identity. Th this is a um, culture, right? That then sort of evolves around that need. And, um, and so it could be uh, stereotypes that are coming from mainstream society. It could be stereotypes that are coming from within LGBTQ society, right? Mm -hmm. um, where people feel like par parts of their experience aren't being seen, right? So like the house ball community, um, many people within those communities experience phenomenal um, classism, poverty, mm -hmm. racism, ethnocentrism, heterosexism, transphobia, <laughs> all at once, right? So 
these um, so communities that evolved to really uniquely address certain sets of, of um, certain different constellations of stigma, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, collectively, there's sort of a subversive power that evolves when as a community, they can say, well, here's this, now we have this structure, we have this network, we have this identity, and we can push back, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes a, a different kind of dialectic that becomes possible. Um, the, third, the third domain is interpersonal. And so this is the idea that gender also is important because it indicates affiliation and it creates security um, flip side that it also can erode security and create distance. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so you're, so as gender, uh, so many people felt, um, uh, many of the participants across the communities also felt a little bit alienated in different contexts because of their sense of gender. And, and, um, and so, um, gender served an interpersonal communication function because, they could say, well, now I can identify as a uh, femme lesbian and I can um, have a group and, I, and the way I look in different contexts will communicate to people that in a way that will make it clear that I'm not, I can communicate that I'm not heterosexual, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And that gives me a sense of affiliation and contact with other people. Um, and that could create some security for me, right? Or I think more, a better example though is um, people who are gender non-conforming, having a, a sense of being able to recognize your gr a group of people who share a same identity as you uh, mm -hmm. is a supportive, important kind of feeling. You have advocates, it gives you a sense of ab advocates, um, more of a sense of safety, uh, more of a sense of support. Uh, and then also being aware of how, you know, what that's like within different contexts. So across communities, people would say, well, um, you know, when I'm in a context where I'm trying to push for change, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm deliberately using signs and signifiers of my gender mm -hmm. to push for change because then I'm visible, mm -hmm. right? I can be recognized. I, I don't, it, it makes evident that LGBTQ people are here, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? That we're part of society. And so there's different kinds of signifiers and symbols within each culture that evolve to sort of express that affiliation. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, people, people were living in a heterosexist transphobic society. Mm -hmm. People made to make decisions about when it's not safe to do that. Mm -hmm. right. And so people may decide, well, okay, I'm going to be now going to I don't know, I'm going to be going to court, I'm going to be arguing mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. my kid, I'm not going to hype up the gender transgression mm -hmm. aspects of my appearance. I'm going to, you know, make other decisions because I know that there's that reality in terms of prejudices and, and stigma in our society. So, so there was this interpersonal whole domain of people making decisions in, in a very conscious way about, um, what they communicate about their different sorts of affiliations and and um and how they do that mm -hmm. especially um, in those different contexts yeah. yeah especially moving across different contexts right yeah. um and then the last one the last function is the, the sexual domain and so mm -hmm. which i think is beautiful and and um i think of it as the most almost the most important one <laughs> in that in that um Within the communities, what happened um, across them was that signs and signifiers of their identity became, were so deeply valued as resistance, right? As, as this like subversive resistance against the mainstream notions of gender that they became eroticized, right? And they became deeply valued by members of the community. And, and this was really important because it, it because people often were told that they were um, undesirable mm -hmm. because of their gender, that they, mm -hmm. that they, they were excluded or ostracized because of their gender. And then within these communities, that same person and that same gender presentation could be the most desirable thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, could be the most valued kind of characteristic. And, uh, and I think that the healing that happens in that sort of aesthetic 
shift is mm. profound and indicates a profound um, acceptance and um, empowerment, right, mm. for people. Mm. So, um, and so, you know, so the very, you know, so for a butch woman, for instance, mm. like the very characteristics that were shunned and, you know, suddenly those are the characteristics that, that make her a desirable partner, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A, a trans person, it could be being gender non-conforming was like mm -hmm. seen as, as a bad thing the whole time they were growing up. And now it's that mm -hmm. gender non-conformity that's mm -hmm. them attractive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful, <laughs> I think a beautiful shift, yeah. I'm wondering if there's anything you want to share about how um, methodological integrity, um, you know, ha show, showed up throughout the process of um, developing this theory, um, if it did. Sure. Um, well, I think that first off, the theory really developed in qualitative research on these seven different, from these seven different communities and with people right. from the seven different communities. So it was really important to us that the theory, it was, it's really important to us and it's really important to me that the theory is empirically driven, that it's not yeah. a theory that is, um, you know, th that's not rooted in, in the stories of people's lives, mm -hmm. uh, but it's coming forward from people's experiences about their challenges and uh, the benefits of their community and their strengths. And, um, and so the, um, I think that the fact that it that it does have that sort of deep grounding in that work, and yeah. it's been you know it's been over twenty years since I began this line of yeah. research, so it's been a long time of also thinking about these mm -hmm. issues and these communities and identities and and their meaning. Um, also, you know, I'm femme identified. A lot of mm -hmm. the researchers, um, many of the researchers had different sorts of connections with the community. The findings invariably we invited and we received feedback from the community members um, to help us shape the findings and to uh, help us be sure that we were communicating them in the right sort of way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so through it, we really worked hard to be having high fidelity in our findings. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, in terms of utility, initially I was really focused on simply the idea of representation and wanting the work to help people understand experiences of gender that they hadn't thought of before mm -hmm. uh, or just didn't know about you know before if they weren't in that community and um and now i feel like it i feel like there's a different level of utility which is thinking more about what is gender on whole and how can we mm -hmm. use a this kind of functionalist perspective to think about <clears throat> gender across LGBT, across heterosexual, across mm -hmm. many different kinds of um, gender experiences and complicate that some and create more <laughs> understanding, right? That, that um, you know, that could help people make sense of something that looks or may feel quite different to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. I feel like in that way, I'm kind of hoping that it will further advocacy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. By, um, you know, not just telling people like, don't say this, <laughs> mm -hmm, right? <laughs> the wrong thing to say, but more develop an understanding of like how this functions mm -hmm. and how your gender, mm -hmm. you know, how your gender functions in a way that may be like genders of people who are different than your gender. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I, I think the way that that all, um, you know, builds up, you know, over those many qualitative studies in these different communities over the years. And then, you know, is showing up in a way that allows you to, you know, kind of speak to the broader community and the broader psychology community as well is, is a really powerful example of, um, you know, the way that um, a body of qualitative work um, can be built, right? I think that it's because there is a very deliberate historical element mm -hmm. and I'm really interested in you know how did that gender construct develop within this community and why was that so based upon the mm -hmm. historical situation of that community from its origin right. forward so I think that's exciting I think the other thing that was interesting to me was noticing that LGBTQ experience really was left out of mm -hmm. experiences of, of the definitions of gender that we have 
uh -huh. forward. Um, right. So really wanting to say, hey, like we need to think about <laughs> gender as being just on the on par with mm -hmm. other genders, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And again, potentially illustrating more about gender and its limits and things like that, you know, because of that marginalization. Yeah. You right. shed light, right? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything you've shared today. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share before we end? I think the only other thing I'd want to add is just uh, to encourage people who are doing qualitative research, especially um, people who are novice qualitative researchers or you know learning to uh, work within the, a review process that often isn't really set up for qualitative research to think of themselves as advocates for qualitative research mm. um and just the same way for you know in terms of the gender theory thinking of yourself as advocates <laughs> right <laughs> that can kind of parallel in a way um that advocating for the things that you believe in that mm. that you think is important mm -hmm. uh, is really important that um developing a sense of what you feel is uh, what you feel inside is a right thing and then thinking about how to talk about that and how to express that. So for in in both papers, right, in the gender paper, I felt like I really wanted to try to express uh, an understanding of gender that I wasn't seeing in psychology mm -hmm. and put that forward. And I, I, you know, hope I don't expect that it's going to work for all communities mm -hmm. and all identities. Um, in I don't think that the communities that I looked at are going to be mirror every other experience. So wanting to encourage people to use that kind of framework mm -hmm. to, to expand it and to push it and to, you know, play with it to come up with different mm -hmm. solutions and it would be beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. And then in terms of the guidelines for methodological integrity, those are really based, I think, in large part on the common kinds of re review responses that we received as qualitative researchers ourselves on the committee mm -hmm. and uh, as co-authors. And so um, so if you're a qualitative researcher submitting work, um, thinking of it as like a resource that you can turn to if you're trying to think of a rebuttal for a review, <laughs> right. or you want to have like a, a grounding for a rebuttal, right, or something to cite <laughs> for a rebuttal in, in your mm -hmm. review process um, can be helpful because it, it, it um, you know, I think it's important for us to really think about how do we develop tools mm -hmm. to support the advocacy of our of our perspectives mm -hmm. um, and really like I guess that spans for me gender LGBTQ and methods. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Gosh well thank you um, again so much for being with us today Dr. Levitt. Really thank appreciate you so much it. For inviting me. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. Um, and thanks also to everybody listening. We hope you enjoyed today's interview and that you'll join us for the next installment of the Squip interview series with distinguished qualitative researchers.